like to welcome you to the talk and tell you a little bit about Dr. Peter Ladd. Um, Dr. Ladd received his undergraduate degree from Duquesne University in Pittsburgh in psychology, so this has been a lifelong um, interest of, of Peter's. He then um, earned his PhD in clinical psychology from U.S. International University in San Diego. So I think Pittsburgh to San Diego is probably a upswing in uh, at least the weather. Um, he joined St. Lawrence University in the mid-70s. Uh, he first coordinated our teacher education program um, from about 1976 to the mid-1980s. He's been a tenured faculty member at St. Lawrence for over 36 years, uh, mainly teaching our mental health counseling um, graduate courses. He's been the coordinator of the uh, Certificate of Advanced Studies in Counseling for eight years, and since 2014, he's been the coordinator of the Mental Health Counseling program, the master's program. I tried to come up with a list of all the courses you've taught, Peter, and here's just some. I don't think this is exhaustive. Um, conflict resolution, marriage and family counseling, multicultural counseling and education, addictions and disorders counseling, intro to mental health counseling, grieving and bereavement counseling, sorry, I'm losing my uh, relationship between schools and families, human development and lifespan counseling, crisis counseling, group procedures, psychopharmacology, and more. Um, and he's also supervised counseling internships and counseling pra practicums. He notably teaches courses on campus and at the Akwesasne Reservation, where the university has a special arrangement with the tribal council to offer graduate um, courses there. And he's helped on campus um, with many faculty staff conflicts over the years trying to mediate disputes. Other interesting experiences um, that Peter has are the clinical mental health supervisor at the Akwesasne Mohawk Reservation for nine years. He's been um, a psychologist, mediator, and facilitator for the Ministry of Health in Canada for um, six years. And he's worked with the Assembly of First Nations for um, a number of years. As you can tell from the um, stack at the back table, he's published numerous books as well as other articles over his years of being a faculty member. Um, today we're here to celebrate and hear about his latest book, which was published by Rowan and Littlefield this past September. And I hope I pronounce this right, as Evelyn said, I'm an economist. The Talk Theory Revolution, Neuroscience, Phenomenology, is that right? And <laughs> Mental Health. Um, he describes this book on his own CV as, quote, a book for talk therapists, challenging a medical model with research, pointing out the healing power of talk therapy. I'm looking forward to hearing the talk because, as um, many of you in this room also have friends and family who have either been on medications for mental health issues or done therapy or done health, so I'm interested to hear what you have to say about it. Thank you, Peter. start off by talking about talk therapy historically and uh, I think we go all the way back to Freud we go back to Alfred Adler Freud more psychodynamically Alfred Adler more in the humanistic vein and so talk therapy has been around for quite a while and uh, as time progressed um, in 1938 in the 40s after the World War II Carl Rogers became really very big in talk therapy from a more humanistic point of view. As far as psychi psychiatrists or uh, psychiatric uh, folks, uh, <clears throat> they still are, they were still using psychodynamic type of talk therapy in the uh, early and middle 50s. Uh, then what happened was a couple of things. Uh, psychotropic drugs, with Prozac being the first, became very, very valuable to psychiatrists because psychiatrists, for the most part, and I've talked to a lot of them, they feel that they want to be a part of medicine. And so this was their opportunity to, to do just that. And so as time went on, psychiatrists stopped doing talk therapy. And for the most part, it ended up in uh, mental health clinics and hospitals that either the licensed social workers did a lot of the talk therapy 
or the mental health counselors did a lot of the talk therapy. And, uh, and that's the way it is at this present time. It's pretty much uh, a medical model in all of these places. And so I want to first tell you what I just tried to talk to you about was really a book that I was really taken with. It was a book called uh, <clears throat> Meaning Making, uh, uh, the cultural Me Culture of Mental Health by someone named Jim Hansen. So I invited Jim to come to St. Lawrence a couple of years ago to do one of these talks. And because I didn't, I, after reading this book, I knew that he had spent a lot of time thinking about how talk therapy and especially humanistic talk therapy, how that fit into the over, overall mental health situation. And so he came and give, gave his talk, and I told him, you know, Jim, that was one of the best description of mental health culture that I had ever heard. And he turned around to me and said, but we need to write another book. And you're in a position to write this book. That was nice of him. Uh, because you've had the experience over the years of actually being trained in both areas. Trained from a medical model and also trained uh, from a more phenomenological, existential, humanistic, whatever suits you, uh, that model. And so I thought about it and then I I thought about it, and finally, I took the next two years and did something about it. And so that's what I'm here to talk about tonight. Um, I have to just say one thing, because I was going to talk about it, then I didn't think I was going to talk about it. But before I get started into comparing these two models, last summer, I was still deeply into getting everything together on this book. And my wife and I would live in Clayton, New York. And in Clayton, they have some really nice restaurants along the St. Lawrence River. And so we were, we were at one of those restaurants. And here was this family sitting with each other at this restaurant. And what happens at a restaurant like that is that these big tankers go right by you almost feel like you can touch them. Now, just remember, I'm thinking neuroscience at the time. So I'm looking at all of them, and I'm realizing that they're all on their iPhone. And I, I was thinking to myself, what a missed opportunity, because, you know, they could talk about the freighter going by. It, seemed like a good part of, the, could be a part of the discussion. They could talk about the food, or they could just talk to each other. And so beyond this talk, I want you to know that I believe that we need a talk therapy revolution, or a talk re revolution beyond, here comes some of my friends. Come on in. It's okay. I haven't even gotten anything yet. I'm just <laughs> talking about food. Uh, so, uh, now, what I said to myself at that time, look at those folks. They're starting to rewire their neuro pathways away from talking to each other and making this more of a norm in that family system. Uh, because in neuroscience, what? Wires together, wires together. And I'm sure no one in that restaurant was thinking exactly that, but I was. So then I thought, okay, I'm going to start this book. I finished the book. And then I, I thought to myself, how can I start this presentation? Well, that's how I started it, with somebody else's book. And also, I got out of the way the thing that was bugging me about that, that family, because they still bug me, you know, that they've heard talking to each other. Uh, so then I, I thought to myself, I, I know what I'll do. I will go back 
to the first time I really had a conflict between a medical model and uh, a more phenomenological model. And so I uh, went to Duquesne University, as Allison said, and I appreciate her with her, her great remarks. I appreciate that. And at the reason, one of the reasons I went to Duquesne was because they were the place in the United States for existential phenomenological psychology. And I had a great interest in that, and I'll tell you later why. But my background, I was sort of a puzzle, you know, straightening out puzzles and more of a, a linear person, math, all of those sorts of things. And so when I went to USIU, as they called it, uh, and enrolled in a clinical psychology program, some of my colleagues said, okay, you're gonna, you're gonna become one of those rats, cats, and stats people. And I hope there's no one in here who's actually one of those people, but <laughs> my apologies if you, if you are in there. There might be I'm sure. So at any rate, I did just that. And let me just flip this slide. Oh, yeah, right. What did I do wrong? <laughs> So here I was, four years at USIU, USIU and uh, I'm, in, I'm working at a, uh, a psychiatric hospital in San Diego. And because of my background, I had very little trouble with the medical model. Oh, really? <laughs> And so basically the medical model is all about analysis, it's very numerical, the DSM-5 is a book based on statistical probability, which I was real happy with because I understood that sort of thing, based on reason, you, could, you had research that you could work with, and um, I felt that I had the knowledge to do this. And so when I was in this uh, hospital, I felt very comfortable. And then there was this patient. I can't remember his name. I tried, but I can't remember his name. Uh, but he talked like this. In other words, he wasn't speaking English. And I was, I was responsible for a diagnosis, and I wanted to put down a schizophreniform disorder, which is basically, he acts like a schizophrenic, but we don't know what the hell he is. And uh, my superior said, no, we're going to make him schizophrenic. And so I put that down. But I would visit him all the time, you know, I had to check... He was probably on some Seroquel or something very strong. And I was going to visit him. And every time I'd come to visit him, he, 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 he'd look at me and he'd go, How's your blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Excuse me. But that, that's exactly what he did. And so something bothered me. <laughs> like this. <laughs> it's almost the same experience, actually. Uh, and, and so, here I had been to Duquesne. I had studied existentialism and Heidegger and all these European folks and European psychology. And I also had some experiences at USIU that put me in, in this position to uh, 
start to say to myself, there's something here that's not right. So here's what I did. When I would go to his bed, bedside and he would talk that way, here's what I did. I'd, he'd go, zero, zero. Then I'd go, zero, zero. <laughs> and uh, periodically, we would have conversations for had a half hour like that. <laughs> Needless to say, my, uh, my very medical model uh, uh, superiors, they sort of thought it was cute, but that's about as much as they thought about it. So one day, I'm sitting on a bench with him, and we're just, we're just sitting there. We'll get to you, Grandma. We're going to... Uh, and, and he says, we're sitting there, and he says, I'm going to the bathroom. And I say, okay. So he's in the bathroom, and I all, all of a sudden realize he actually talked to me. So when he came out, I said, did you say that you were going in the bathroom? And he said, yes. And uh, I said, well, why, why now would you be talking to me? He said, because you were the first person that took the time, just be with me, stay with me, basically saying, go into his world. And he decided that was enough for him to come out. And he said, how do I get out of here? And I said, two things you have to do to get out of here. First of all, you have to clean up your hygiene because that's one of the reasons they thought he was schizophrenic. The second one was you have to speak in full sentences, subject, verb, object. And my tenure there moved on, but I heard later on that he had gotten out. And what that, did, what that did for me, though, was I went back to my notes. That was around 1976. And it wasn't specifically in these words. But these were the questions that I was asking myself, you know, as someone who's 27, 8 years old, about this whole thing. You know, what is the difference between knowledge and wisdom? That came up because I felt that I had plenty of the knowledge to help him. Uh, is the effective domain measurable? And I thought, well, they really haven't been able to measure it at that time. But then I thought, if it cannot be measured, is it still important? And at that time, it was not that important. And then I finally came down to who is responsible for the patient's point of view. I'm actually going to leave that now. And that's one thing that I thought a great deal about when I came here. That was sometime in May, and I came here in September. And by the way, I came and started the, a teacher education program, which uh, to many of my colleagues and friends said, what the hell are you doing? You just finished with a clinical psychology degree, and uh, you did quite well, and people thought that. Why are you starting a teacher ed degree? And the answer is simply this. They told me that they were looking for something new. And I had this other background in existential phenomenology. And so what I did was, I, was, I, I figured that a teacher can reach 150 people a day. And as a clinical psychologist, we, at the most, maybe reach 150 people a year. So it wasn't, it wasn't so much the labels, it was the experience. And by the way, it was a wonderful experience. And one thing that St. Lawrence does that I've always appreciated is that they give you one day a week that you can go out and do something, whether it's research or whatever it is. And I found myself very early on up in the Akwesasne Mohawk Reservation. And to make this, uh, which I did a lot of things up there, 
But one thing, a couple things that I did was I started a, a medical model, mental health clinic on the American side of the reservation. Why medical model? Because that's how the funding came and I wasn't against a medical model. But, uh, and so I did that. And in 1990, they had a, a lot of violence up there and I was up there conciliating and peacemaking and that sort of thing. And after it was all over, on the Canadian side, they wanted to do something, they wanted their own mental health clinic, but they wanted something more native. And so I helped them set up what was called Holistic Health and Wellness Program, which was still taking in insurance and giving people labels and all that sort of thing. But what they also were doing is we were working more from an intuitive, affective model. And so I think that's why Jim Hansen said, you might be the person to compare these models and, you know, and write a book on it. Because I had had a lot of experience on both models. And I think both models are trying to do the same thing. Both models for me are trying to get to the truth. Both models are trying to get to the truth. And what do I mean by that? Well, what I mean is that in a medical model, in order to get to the truth about helping somebody, they've had, they had a, uh, they brought together different committees to talk about different phenomena or different, uh, different disorders and then they would uh, try to statistically come down to what are the symptoms of, the, of these disorders. And, and so they were looking for the truth by a very modern way of looking for the truth, using a scientific inquiry where you, you, know, you, um, you research the information about a person, you come up with a diagnosis about the person, then you uh, develop a treatment plan around the diagnosis, and you know you adjust the treatment plan if it goes one way or the other. Uh, a more phenomenological model finds truth a different way. I have to admit I'm a postmodernist professor. And so I have a very postmodern perspective. And what is that? Well, if from a postmodern perspective, if you look at a tree and you're, uh, you're a carpenter, you look at the tree and you see how many board feet are in that tree. If you're a botanist, you're looking at the same tree, but you see the leaves, you see, you know, how the leaves are formed and that sort of thing. And so you're looking at it from your own perspective. It's not that one is right or wrong, it means that you find meaning in your own perspective. And so a more phenomenological model is based more on how the client sees their disorder. And when you think about it, it becomes a very crucial point in your learning to be a talk therapist, how you look at people. From a medical model, what you basically do is that you observe their behavior and you gather symptoms and then you go to the book where the statistical probability was all worked out and if it matches up, that's pretty much what happens. You get that particular diagnosis. From a more phenomenological model, you base it on gaining experience. You see people, and sometimes you see something that you don't know what it's like, and then you see it in other people, or you ask them about it, and so you start to figure out these sort of neurological patterns or phenomenological patterns that fit a whole group of people. And so that's how you, you find truth, that way. 
Now the difference is, is that uh, a medical model fundamentally comes down to who you are. I am ADHD, you know, I am bipolar. A more phenomenological mo model really is based on what you are going through. And so what the, what the client is going through neurologically or cognitively or emotionally or behaviorally or the environment in which they live, that perspective, and then the job is for the talk therapist to direct that in some way. Now I have to just throw one thing, and I know it sounds cynical, but I can't help myself. <laughs> well, yeah, I could help myself, but uh, In 1973, a miraculous thing happened. Millions, millions of people were cured overnight. Millions of people were cured overnight. Uh, homosexuality was taken out of the DSM-3. <laughs> so all I'm saying, and I'm not knocking the medical model, but be careful. Be careful how you come up with labels through committee. Anyway, that's what I want to say. Now I'm going to tell you about Sandy Swamp. By the way, that isn't Sandy Swamp. That's an old lady I, I googled and found. It. <laughs> sort of reminded me of Sandy Swamp. I didn't have a picture of Sandy Swamp. I get this, I get this I'm over at the Holistic Health and Wellness Clinic, and I'm doing my day up on the res. And they said, we have this, this woman, and here's the file, and it came from a psychiatrist in, um, in Cornwall. And when I looked at the file, what it basically said is that she's, 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 in, she's an older woman, I, I, the reason I'm laughing is because she's probably my age now. But uh, the psychiatrist had written a lot of information that she was delusional and that she was uh, clinically depressed. And when I looked at how the psychiatrist came to that conclusion, it was pretty much based on observing her behavior and then going to the DSM and matching the behavior, and um, that's what came out. So I met with her, <clears throat> and I, when I talked to her, there was this sort of flicker in her face that didn't remind me of someone who was de delusional. It reminded me of someone who was embarrassed. So, I said, uh, how do you see your problem? And she said, well, my husband is going on his journey, he's passed, and, uh, I gotta make sure I don't talk too much. Uh, he's going on his journey, he's passed, and he came back to me. And I'm sure what she did is talk to the psychiatrist as though he, he should be there, or he was there, and the psychiatrist probably said, oh, okay, I can, I'm observing someone who's delusional. But the truth be known, in that culture, dream states and waking states are held with equal value. And I knew that. And so instead of coming up with some diagnosis, I came up with this really important counseling technique. Here it is. I said to her, well, what did he say? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But I just find that funny for some reason. He said that I should go to my granddaughter, who's starting to take drugs and alcohol, and straighten her out. So I said, okay, why don't you go do it? And she said, the psychiatrist told me that I was clinically depressed, and my family won't let me go. So I called the family in, 
And I said, you know, I think she ought to go. And so she, she goes, and uh, she really, as in that culture is very common, she is called uh, a duda, which is someone of respect, and the granddaughter listens and helps her. She helps her granddaughter. And she comes back the next week with a big smile on her face. It was the quickest cure for clinical depression I've ever seen. <clears throat> and so I'm, I'm, I don't see that flicker in her face anymore. Because I'm picking up that it's really embarrassment or humiliation because, you know, you can't, here you are and your, your husband tells you to do something and out of honor for him you need to go do it, but you've been told you're not going to do it. And, you know, so I said to her, what is one thing that you value the most? Something that you did that was important? And she said, they used to call me the pie lady. I said, what do you mean? Well, I used to make pies down in the village. People always would come and eat, eat my pies because they were good. I said, well, bring a pie in next week. So she comes back next week, seriously, no clinical depression, had a smile on her face, she seemed really good. But a big pie, she puts it on the table outside the office that I'm in. And we go in, and about 20 minutes in, I said to her, what did you do with that pie? She says, oh, I, I left it outside the office. I said, you can't do that with mental health counselors. <laughs> I'm not going to get any pie. <laughs> and sure enough, we came out, the pie was obviously just gone. So the next week, she, she came back and brought a big pie and a little one for me. <laughs> but she said to me, my husband came to me. And I'm using my very sophisticated training. I said to her, well, what did he say? I laugh every time I say it. He said, good job. <laughs> <laughs> and so, if you look at the tree, I'm not saying that the psychiatrist was off. Well, yeah, I am saying that the psychiatrist missed, the, missed it. I'm not saying that psychiatrists miss it because of that medical model. I just know there's also another way to look at things that goes beyond just one way of looking at things. And that happens to be the model that, uh, that I used with her. See, I went, I, that one slide doesn't like me. So let's, let's get to this in a more neuroscientific way. What did the, where was the psychiatrist? How were they viewing Sandy? And basically, uh, you see the red part of the, the brain there. Now, for you neuroscientists in the group, forgive me because, you know, I had the first run through of these slides, I had neuroscience coming all the way off the slide and around. And so I've really, uh, buy the book and you can get the full picture. Uh, but for the most part, uh, a medical model is based on the rational mind. It's based on logic. It's based on making rational decisions. Even decisions that are based on statistical probability. And I have no problem with that. And so through the whole process, Psychotropic drugs are also based on a rational diagnosis. And so is developing the treatment plan based on a rational diagnosis. And practicing counseling techniques, which is what the talk therapist does, uh, is not something just comes about because the talk therapist decides that this seems to be where we're going. No, it's a part of a plan that based on the hypothesis, so if you're lucky and you get it right, it's very helpful to somebody. But how about in this case? How about in this case where uh, delusional was not accurate, clinical depression was also not accurate, 
And so I'm not saying give up the medical model. I mean, I, I could say that, but since 95% of everything done in mental health is from a medical model, that would be kind of uh, not a good thing for me. But I do, I do know this, that the, a medical model follows the same procedures in mental health as it does in physical health. You know, you uh, gather your information with tests. You come up with a hypothesis as to what is wrong. You know, you develop a treatment plan. Maybe it's surgery, maybe it's something else. And you see if it works. And so that is fundamentally how a medical model uh, talk therapist looks at a patient or a client, depending on the word you like. Here's, here's how, and by the way, I put some of the chapters in the book, there's 12, so what I hit on? I hit on five, okay. Uh, <coughs> how does a more phenomenological talk therapist, and I put, uh, it's also neurological, which I'll get to in a minute, but how do they look at the patient? How are they doing that? They're looking at the client's experiences, and some of the things that they're taking into consideration is not just that red portion of the, of the, of the neural cortex, frontal neural cortex. They're taking in, you see that purple stuff in the middle that looks about the size of a lemon? That's called the limbic system, and that's where the emotions are. And so, the interesting thing for me is that when you start to move from strictly rational thought over into more af the affective domain, you're actually using more of the brain. You're still using the prefrontal cortex, but you're also now getting into the hippocampus. I know one of the persons that was here, we talk about that. Uh, the amygdala, which is the crisis center. And, uh, and so in some ways, you're using more of the brain. And I'm going to now talk about some of these things, but first... A medical model addresses a closed system where what happens in the brain, central nervous system, and other parts of the body will be reflected in the mind of the patient. Therefore, in this closed system, if psychotropic drugs are given, for example, to a depressed person, neurotransmissions may change in the brain, bringing relief to the patient's pain. I want, before I get into, oh Jesus, do it again. <laughs> Man, tell me. Uh, before I get into looking at a more phenomenological model, I, the first thing I have to do is tell you that how we look at the mind and how we look at the brain has changed. You know, from traditionally, the way we looked at the mind is that if you change portions of the brain, and it will change portions of the mind. You'll think differently. And so that's a closed system. It has very little to do with talk therapy, but it has a lot to do with how the brain and the mind works. And it's a perfect system for big pharma. It's a perfect system for psychotropic drugs, because if you can change the neural pathways in someone's brain, or clean up the neural pathways is really what happens. In other words, uh, SSRIs or um, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. The inhibitors is the important part of that. Prozac, all those antidepressants are under those. Inhibitors means that Maybe the depression or anxiety came because at the synapses of different uh, neurotransmitters that things are moving too fast, so they're not really being used correctly. And so that's basically what SSRIs are supposed to do. They're supposed to slow down that so 
it helps these old neural pathways work better. And by the way, uh, it works. That's obviously something that uh, has helped a lot of people. But just remember this, it's not changing the person, it's changing the symptoms. Now here's, the, here's my problem, beyond obviously this. Uh, in medicine, I have never heard anybody say, I am cancer, I am stroke. Have you ever heard anybody talk about themselves that way? But in mental health, have you ever, ever heard anybody say, I am bipolar, I am ADHD? What are we talking about here? We're talking about a model that will help you with your symptoms, but in the course of helping you with your symptoms, since they have labeled you, they might also be, uh, uh, I was gonna say infecting, I don't mean that, uh, might be redirecting how you see yourself. And then I've had somebody say to me, I can't, you can't ask me to change, I'm bipolar, things like that. And so, that's one of the downsides. And the other, the other thing I think uh, that I've seen when that isn't handled correctly, and by the way, you can get a good talk therapist who can clear that up in a medical model, so I'm not in any way putting that down. I think what can happen is learned helplessness. All of a sudden, you're not thinking about changing your life, you're thinking about stabilizing your life, and as long as you can keep the drugs, you can passively go through your life. To me, the, one of the worst things is not crashing and burning. One of the worst things for me is coping. Because you're not getting better and you're not getting worse. And these drugs sometimes can keep you right there. However, phenomenologists like myself have always been in trouble, you know, in psychology, until the neuroscientist saved us. That old closed system that had been working for all those years, all of a sudden the neuroscientists were discovering that talking to people on PET scans, PET scans or MRIs or things like that were changing the neural pathways in people's brains. That's about the same time that they figured out that the brain is one of the most plastic organs in the body. It can change even at a, a, a very serious dialogue. The reason I didn't like that family with their cell phones, that kind of you know, interaction doesn't change the brain. This is Daniel Siegel, and uh, he's a neurobiologist. Uh, I have a good relationship with him in a lot of ways. And he says, we now know that where attention goes, neural firings flows, and neural connections grow. And so basically what he's saying, I'll take it from my addiction course, if you have an addiction, and you're constantly aware of the addiction and using the addiction, that's going to build up a whole neural network of when you have trouble, it'll go through that neural network network to the striatum is what it's called and you know you're going to reinforce your addiction and what what it, what happens though is that it starts to kill off some of those other important neural pathways like compassion and empathy and so uh, from a neuro, from a more neurophenomenological point of view what the research has shown is that when we think about the mind, when we think about the brain, we better be thinking about relationships too, because they're all interdependent on each other. They change because they're all connected. And so, if you want your brain to be rewired differently, that's why mindfulness and all these uh, procedures that have become yoga and meditation, 
One of the reasons they've become so popular is because by doing those things, it will start to rewire your brain. And by rewiring your brain, your mind will then start to affect your relationships. And so, for we phenomenologists, it's like heaven. Because we've said all along, you can't separate a person from their world. And the neuroscientists came along and really helped us with that. And awareness, with that family with the phones, they're not rewiring their brain. They're not even aware of the ship, let alone to talk about the ship or to talk to each other. And now this is pretty much the new accepted way of looking at the mind. It's not just a closed system. It's open to the outside world. Well, for talk therapists, we think that's great. I'll just go through this fast. Yeah, I'll go through it fast. So what is a phenomenological talk therapist when they really connect and talk to somebody? What happens? They create mental perceptions and awareness of the world. In other words, they're opening new possibilities to the client so that they see the world a bit differently. And what does that do? What does a talk, actual dialogue do? The dialogue helps to de develop new neural networks. It will start, uh, you know, uh, you can either take the Prozac and repair the old neural network, or you can start a new one over here. And it helps to understand new approaches to, to the integrated mind. And more and more, in my own therapy, I've shown people how the brain works, I show them how they all work together, and I can tell you, people want wisdom. They're not so much interested in the knowledge. They want wisdom. A medical model? The medical model is really efficient when applied to old neural networks. It doesn't change them like the talking does, but it cleans them up. And so, if you're in crisis, you're not going to sit down with somebody and use phenomenological talk therapy. I mean, if a person's in crisis, you're not going to say, now tell me what's bothering you. They're going to flip right out on you. And so, the medical model works really well for crisis counseling. When people aren't at the point where they can put meaning into their talk. And so, that's why those psychotropic drugs work for them. But if you just use them and don't talk through these things, they focus on your symptoms, not your neural pathways, or developing a new, what I would call, growth and change. And so, the thing I don't like about counseling techniques, and I've taught techniques of counseling, I don't think the counseling technique should be an intervention based on a hypothesis. I think during a, a collaborative talk with people, if someone says something that leads to a counseling technique, that's when you should do the counseling technique. Why? Because it now has meaning for the client. I can tell you, I've done CBT, I've done all, you know, co cognitive behavioral therapy, and it works. And three months later, it drifts away. Until a client finds meaning in these things, they don't keep them. They do them, they believe in them, and then they drift away. Now I want to talk about intuition for just a moment. One of my heroes is Albert Einstein. And what he says up there I think is really accurate. Intuitive mind is a sacred gift, and the rational mind is a faithful, a faithful servant. We have created a society that honors the servant and has forgotten the gift. When I saw that woman's face flutter, something spoke to me, something hit me, that something's wrong here. By the way, uh, Albert Einstein 
spent a lot of time doing rational thought. But when he came up with E equals MC squared, his intuitive mind had that come to him in a dream. So what is intuition? Well, first of all, it's based more on wisdom than knowledge because it's not using the, the prefrontal cortex and it's not using the, the hippocampus to collect knowledge. It's fundamentally bigger than that, like I showed before in that slide, where that whole uh, lemon-sized you know, uh, uh, system, that whole uh, emotional center. So it takes in the prefrontal cortex, but also something called the locus ceruleus, which are those gut feelings. So the gut feelings start to come up and they merge with your rational thought. And what happens, and by the way, that is really unfair to the process. It's in the book, but I couldn't fit a lot of it on the slide. But what happens is that you get this condensed re reasoning that, that makes swift intuitive judgments. And they are not based on knowledge, they are based on wisdom. Because the brain has a way of being very efficient and bringing all that stuff down to a certain intuitive thought. Now I'm going to tell you a story of Anne Marie uh, Churchill, who was a co-author of another book that we put out in 2012, what was person-centered diagnosis and treatment. We decided to write a book to counteract the DSM-4 at the time. <laughs> That's just so silly, but uh, it was a very popular book. Anne Marie had a client who had a heart attack at 7 o'clock every night. Every night she had a heart. This woman had a heart attack. And so she took her to the clinic up there, put her on the treadmill, and made sure that she wasn't having a heart attack. But the second thing she did, uh, and from a medical model, they would have called that a somatic symptom disorder. Okay. Anne Marie was involved in talking to her, and her remnants of her brother in the conversation and the client never talked about her brother never brought it up and at one point Anne Marie just it all started to condense in the locus ceruleus and the ventral medial prefrontal cortex it all kind of came together and Anne Marie said to her well, what about your brother well, nothing about my brother. So she goes home and comes back the next week and says to Anne Marie, my brother raped me when I was a child. And how do you get to that through a rational medical model mind? Intuitive decision making, I will show you. Don't you like those little crumbly things I've been doing? I'm so proud. <laughs> so how does intuition work? Actually, Freud had figured it out, but if you read Freud's case studies, they really are quite phenomenal. But if you read his theories, they're pretty much uh, based on a combustion engine, but but this is part of my theory, a little bit. Instincts are inherited or acquired habits. And in the brain, what happens is that either the instincts are there because they're genetic. You might have a predisposition to depression or anxiety, which is fine. But, well, it's not fine. But you also have developed habits. In other words, you've fired and gone through this, these neural pathways over and over again for a lot of reasons. And I wrote a book, well, Anne Marie Churchill wrote that book, we wrote that back book in 2012, but I had written a book in 2009, which I'm, all, I'm being encouraged now to rewrite it and put the neuroscience in those days, we didn't have that. It was called Emotional Addictions. And I 
this is all me, so you know. I don't believe I don't believe that men, I don't believe in mental disorders. First of all, they're not just mental. And they're not a disorder. What they cause is disorder. I think what they are are addictions, patterns of addictions that get constantly get re wired and fired and rewired over and over again. And so that is really important when it comes to, and intuition is sort of picking all that up. And it's right under the surface, and all you have to do is watch what's going on, and all of a sudden, aha moment comes, and insights come out. Here's what I mean about For me, most disorders are really habitual decisions based on negative thinking, genetics, trauma, attachment issues, etc. And if you constantly repeat them, they develop into neuro patterns. And habitual decisions are made by repeating and reinforcing old neural pathways. Now, if you, most of what mental health, uh, excuse me, the medical model does is a calculated decision where they're seeking a logical outcome and they're controlling the data based on a close perception of the brain and mind. And I'm saying that, yes, they fix old neural pathways, but when you start to make intuit intuitive decisions with a client, which is bottom-up thinking, the mind, brain, and outside experiences start to connect. And this new essential pattern develops and develops into something that breaks through the surface and becomes that aha moment. That's what Einstein did when he come up with, came up with E equals MC squared. So intuitive decisions are made leading to developing new neural pathways. So in my talk therapy, and by the way, in the mental health counseling program where people were taught, they were taught both. They were taught about medical model and a phenomenological model. They were taught both. Because it's not that one's right and one's wrong. It's that you can look at a tree two different ways. <clears throat> Here's somebody who actually spent a week here at St. Lawrence, Carl Rogers. And uh, he uh, had a big influence on my life, actually. You know, uh, I ended up writing. Uh, something, a chapter in one of his books. He sat down on my living room floor, took his shoes off and joined a group that I was doing there, and uh, he disappeared into the group. He was so attuned. Here's something that happens. Something called mirror neurons are something that will pick up what you're saying and feeling, or what, how you, what the picture you see in your head you can pick up that and mirror it into your own head. I like to call them sponge you know, neurons because they sort of soak up anything that's going into your head. And the superior temporal cortex goes through the insula, which is a reason for self-awareness, down through the limbic system, and all of a sudden it goes back up through and somehow or another, you are attuned. It's called a therapeutic alliance. I can tell you right now that uh, it's probably one of the most important things in talk therapy, to attune to your client. Here's the story of Mike and the, and the client's brother. Mike was counseling this woman who, there's no question she had trauma from her childhood. And Mike was very intuitive, and he could attune very well with people. And, and they were going on and on, and, and he finally said to the woman, would you like a female therapist? And her face completely changed. Thank you, I, I really like you, you know, and you've done a great job and you're very helpful, but you look like my brother. And, and 
eventually that person uh, was successful. And so Rogers, that's, he really talks a lot about attunement. Well, I'm really not a touchy-feely person, quite frankly, even though I've been called that many times. Uh, I'm more of a math person. But when I look at this, I know what that all means. You need to connect with that person to help that person heal. <clears throat> I'm going to go through this. This is a Fred's group experience. It, it was uh, out in uh, California, we had a group experience, and uh, we're all in a circle, and this woman comes in very late and sits down next to Fred and says to Fred, I want you to know, no, it says to everybody first, I want you to know I love all of you. For, you're going to be clinical psychologists. You know, you're going to help humanity, humankind, I guess. And turns to Fred and says, and I love you. And Fred sort of went, whoa, back <laughs> off. <laughs> the truth is that a therapeutic alliance, in the beginning of this uh, lecture, you're checking me out and I'm checking you out. We're focusing. We look for in therapy someone coming out. Whether they come out through tears or come out through happiness or come out through anger, we're getting closer, we're becoming more attuned. At some point, you know when you have the therapeutic alliance built because you, you're built, you have a certain appreciation for each other. And here's what she was doing, and that goes on to affection, etc. We were all checking each other out, and where was she? All the way down to affection. Totally not attuned with anybody because she was actually turned out that the reason she wanted to treat us all with affection because she didn't really want to talk about her stuff. So that was her way to do that. Here's a great quote, folks. It sort of is, I'm very, it's a very personal quote for me. The more one forgets himself by giving himself to a cause to serve another person to love, the more human he is. A lot of the problems in, with disorders is that you live in a bubble and you're constantly thinking of yourself. Not, you're not doing that, you know, uh, you're not trying to do that. It's just the pain is so much that it keeps coming back. This is a, a surprise chapter for me because I've heard all along that, you know, we have this survival instinct where, you know, it's fight, flight, or freeze. That, you know, that's how we survived. I'm here to tell you I don't think so. When you read up in neuroscience, there's another whole phenomenon that goes on in neuroscience. It's when the dorsal medial prefrontal cortex uh, predicts altruistic behavior when, si when the situation is more equitable between two people. Think about the forest fires out in California. When the situations are equal, we are far more compatible and, ha and, want, and, and far more selfless to go help other people than, than we are by saying the reason we've survived all these years is because of our, of our fight, flight, and fear instinct. Don't get me wrong. One of the problems in our world is that things aren't very equal. And so we just use that more. But when you really come down to it, selfless, Selfless acts are important. By the way, one of the reasons I was so confused out there at USIU, this is Viktor Frankl. I don't know if you people know of him, but he was in Auschwitz and a whole bunch of other places. I happened to be his graduate assistant for a year. So that took me, it's probably why I got hired here, I don't know. But, uh, what a tremendous person. What a tremendous person. 
talk about somebody who was authentic. He liked to rock, rock climb, and so about 40 pounds ago I used to rock climb and even do things like that. But he helped me with my dissertation. Probably the most influential person in my life. That's Martin Buber. I happen to really have an appreciation for Martin Buber because basically what he says is that, well, I explained neurologically, but it's those aha moments that when you looked at that iceberg, which finally came out, Martin Buber basically says that gen genuine dialogue has three voices, yours, mine, and the dialogue itself. The dialogue, dialogue itself can heal by creating insight. You, can't even, you don't have to talk about your problems. Sometimes just the dialogue itself will create insight. Okay, here's both those models I've been talking about. When I really think about it, how, where was it that I actually came upon these two different ways of solving problems? And actually, uh, many years ago, I, uh, I worked for the Army Security Agency, which is like ASA, was like NSA, except they had um, air conditioning offices in Fort Meade, Maryland, and we had rice paddies and jungles <laughs> to, 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 to run around in. And so, the job, we were trained at Fort Devens, Massachusetts in cryptography and cryptoanalysis and all that. We went to Monterey, California for language, and then we're off to the big war. And at that time, we were trained seriously in sort of a medical model way of doing things. To solve a code, you gather knowledge about the problem, you make a hypothesis, you come up with a plan and you act out the plan and try to control the outcome. And so I was good at puzzles, so there I was in that group. And, and, and it worked pretty well. But over there, there was so much pressure for people in that profession, the crypto analysts, that everything, no matter what you did, it was bad. If you broke a code, it was bad, <laughs> because so many people ended up dead. If you didn't break the code, it was bad. And if you broke the code and it wasn't complete, then it was bad, because you're bad, you didn't do your job, or whatever it may be. And so, I realized that I can't think all the time because we were working seven days a week, and I, I said, "I just, I'm gonna, my mind's going to go off." And by the way, the, the, the attrition rate for people like that was really high. And I don't know how I came upon this, but what I did was I stopped thinking, and I focused on uncovering the code to the problem. And I just kind of would look at it from different angles and look around and keep looking and looking and looking. I do, and I dwell on these avenues. I wouldn't think about it, just dwell on it. And I trust, it wasn't trying to control it, I just trusted the process. I was drinking a little Stonich Naya vodka too, which might have helped with that whole process, I don't know. but. But I wasn't doing drugs, so I just did a little bucket. Uh, and all of a sudden, the code would pop out. And so I did that. I was in doing that for four years. And uh, there's plenty of PTSD to go around. But I think that's kind of how I survived. But I was completely, I had no idea how that worked, how I survived that. So it was really on a big thing in my mind, and that's why I went to Duquesne, because I wanted to find out how did, how, that's a whole other way of solving a problem that I have no idea what it was about. And so, those were my code-breaking days, but I want to give you something, 
I'm going to give you a little code breaking to do. In this next slide, I want you to find the animal in the picture. Now here, just a little hint. Don't try to think about it. Trust the process. Let it finally pop out. You ready? genius, but you probably won't do good in some classes. <laughs> do you see it? I'm not trying to expose you anal retentive people, okay? <laughs> now look at it. Do you see it? You have just, for you who can see it, can you see it? You can see it. You'd see it if you could look at it. Now try to forget, if you can see it, try not to see it. You won't be able to, trust me. It'll just be there, and it won't go away. So you now are official code breakers. In phenomenology, they would call that a discipline naivete where you focus on something highly disciplined, but you clear your mind and let the situation speak to you. And in talk therapy from a phenomenological point of view, that happens all the time. I'm gonna go through this fast, but this is just one of my heroes. It's Joseph White, who was the first person who really got involved in positive psychology and basically what he, this is a whole thing on hope. You might as well have hope because it uses the same neural pathways as analgesics that help reduce the pain and improve your health. So hope is a very powerful thing. It's the ability to transfer energy from something that's not working into something that works. He would say, which I love, do something out of nothing. I'm just like I'll go through this quickly. One of the things that bothers me about a medical model, it doesn't focus on hope, and hope is so important in talk therapy. And what happens, I teach people about hope. You know, decide to change direction when something's not working. Gather that energy, transfer it, make it meaningful, gain flexibility. I had a client who uh, was, was trying to come out of her depression, and uh, she said to me, I'm afraid I won't do the right thing. So I said to her, well then do the wrong thing, but do something. Because it doesn't matter, if you do the wrong thing, you can always transfer that energy again and again and again. I'm very proud of that slide. <laughs> well, I'm hitting into some of my buddies up in the res, and basically, a lot of my time these days is focused on wisdom over knowledge to a certain degree. And, you know, we gather knowledge to control the world, and we've done a fairly good job for our technology, and I'm not judging that. In mental health, through statistical probability, from the DSM. And by the way, that's very effective in the business model of mental health. It controls, I mean, you probably couldn't have, uh, if you didn't have a DSM, you would have to invent one. Because you need to keep things separate. The trouble is, if you go to the, P, the, the uh, price drop or, over here and you're looking for peas, and the label says peas and you open up as carrots, that's when you have problems. Wisdom is different. We gather wisdom to trust our involvement in the world. In mental health, through human experiences, effective for the client-patient experience in mental health. I just have found many times that if the, uh, the medical model overstates its case, they start to lose the client. And if you focus on observation of symptoms for mental health, 
but really attuning yourself and then being intuitive and hopeful and all these things for the, for the client, uh, they start to really internalize and it means something to them. And by the way, there is some, there's a difference between knowing something and knowing your way around something. You can read all the books you want on skiing, but until you go down that hill, you don't know your way around skiing. Thank you. 